Yo, shake my hand, 365, and welcome to another video. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If you're new, uh, please do the, you know, the right things, like, subscribe, pay attention to the things I say. Um, you know, a lot of this channel is just built on providing pure market education. If you're a trader, investor, short-term trader, swing trader, positional trader, stocks trader, crypto uh, 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 trader, or an investor, you know, I try to cover everything. Uh, 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 you know, based on what we, we, we do here, right? Today, I want to just quickly cover what happened last night, right? Jerome Powell, uh, we had an FOMC conference with a live, you know, uh, FOMC meeting last night. We had a Fed fund rate that remained unchanged last night. And in this video, I want to quickly package together exactly what was said, what that means, but also teach you how to read the tone. You know, all and a lot of the time you hear me say he's hawkish or dovish, um, or, or you'll see it in his business articles, but you actually don't know what that means, or you don't know how to read into that. And that has a massive potential on how it actually affects your trading, how it actually, you know, shapes, you know, market sentiment. Uh, and so that's really what I want to get into today. Also, if you recall, I did say my traders' war rooms are coming back from the 1st of May. That means every week now, I'll be giving you guys my week to week in signals right here on the YouTube channel. You don't pay for my signals. I just tell you where I'm going to buy or sell forex stocks, crypto indices, commodities, you know, you know, options, whatever it is that I'm looking at in the market. I'll do a full analysis with you week by week. And then you can decide for yourself if you want to take that risk, right? So I want to do this today so that tomorrow or this coming weekend, I'm recording this, you know, on Thursday, the 2nd of May, I think, right? So this coming weekend when I'm, when I'm working through the war room stuff, I would like to have covered this already just to shorten, you know, the war room videos, right? So uh, uh, let's just get straight into it, right? So, so, so there are a few things that, you know, I found interesting about Powell's meeting last night. And maybe before I forget, if you ever at any point in time ever want to um, um, I learn how to trade the way I do. The link is down below somewhere. You just uh, uh, feel free to click the link and then join me, join my team, join 365, right? Get, you know, the right information, right? But F Federal Reserve uh, held its ground on interest rates. Um, and, you know, in my last previous video, I did say this was going to happen. You know, uh, they decided not to cut rates. Uh, uh, you know, basically weighing the continuous battle of inflation. And I find this so ironic because this is exactly where I left us before my one year sabbatical break. You know, everything that Jerome Powell said yesterday was extremely similar to where things were. Like, you know, in 2023 of January, you know, it's just kind of like spilled over. And if you guys remember my old videos in those war rooms, I kept telling you that inflation is a crazy monster. You know, it's a very hybrid monster. It's like a virus. It can adapt. It can spike out. It can actually act like it's getting under control and then come back up again. So it really requires a tactical fed, uh, um, 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 you know, most of the time and time, lots of time, lots and lots of time. So we, we have the same problem. It almost feels like I'm picking up the ball, you know, where I left it, right? Uh, here's a direct quote that I just want to quickly read to you. And let me see if I can uh, pull it up on my screens. Uh, it's actually going to take time. Never mind. Right. So let me just read from here. Right. So the committee does not expect it. It will be appropriate to reduce the target range. The committee, the Fed committee, does not expect it will be appropriate 
to reduce the target range until it's gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably towards 2%, right? And we know, we know that we are very far away from that mark, but uh, I first wanna just break down what Powell said from Powell's perspective, from the FOMC's perspective, then I'll come back to you and we'll give that 365 spin, right? So there are a couple of things that, you know, I want us to kind of like take it back to the basics. If you don't mind, I promise you this is gonna be a short video or shorter, you know, than usual, but I do believe that there are a couple of things that we, we can actually address. Number one, rate hikes. What are rate hikes? What do we mean by rate hikes, right? So when the economy is overheated, when there is stimulus, when there is uh, uh, spending, buying, loaning by the banks, right? Inflation naturally climbs. The, the biggest catalyst is printing money. When the Fed prints a lot of money, you know, you know, circulating the market, in this case with the dollar, which actually devalues the dollar, but more importantly, it boosts a lot of economic activity because you can spend, I can spend, we can spend, I can get a grant check, I've got a job, we can keep spending. So there's a lot of money moving in the, in, in, in the market, right? Inflation generally goes up. Now the central bank, when I talk about rate hikes, I'm giving you guys a clean, I need you to remember this the next time you watch a uh, you know, Powell talk. I need you to remember this the next time you see a crazy headline uh, in, in terms of markets. I need you to remember this in terms of sentiment, right? So rate hikes, we're looking at when the economy is overheated, inflation is too high, and the central bank would like to taper the growth, control the growth, slow down the growth, and they do that by increasing the rate. So interest rates have to go up. Now this is known as a rate hike. I'm hiking the rate, I'm, 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 I'm taking it up. By design, the rate hike tends to slow the economy, right? We're not talking about, you know, it's not an immediate thing, but the idea is, you know, the more expensive it is to borrow money while tightening your printing, your QE, your quantitative easing, right? Slowly but surely, that impact will eventually trickle down to the economy. People will start spending less because borrowing is now more expensive. Your home loan will jump from 11% to 23%. That's happening right now in South Africa. Your credit uh, card, the interest rate will fluctuate, you know, to a higher number just to slow down, to taper the economy. Now, this should in general cut demand for goods because, you know, all of a sudden you're thinking about essentials than lavish living, right? And labor in turn and overall, we hike the rates or there's rate hikes to reduce inflation, all right? So, so when Powell comes up to give us a rate hike, he's trying to reduce inflation because his red flags are saying inflation is the main big problem. Let's, let's do a quick rate hike, right? And we saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of that before I went away on my break. Now, rate cuts are something different. Actually, the opposite. Rate cuts is when the economy is slow and central banks want to stimulate growth, want to increase growth. So they decrease the rates, cut the rates, rate cuts, right? Cheaper, they make it cheaper to borrow, cheaper to lend, cheaper, 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 right? Then they cut the rates, and this is known as a rate cut, and the central bank lowers interest rates. The commercial banks are then able to borrow at a cheaper rate, and businesses, private loans, your credit cards, etc., become more accessible, become slightly more cheaper, right? Now, in this scenario, all parties would refrain from getting loans, right? In the opposite scenario, in rate hikes, during rate hike season, it's expensive to get a loan, but in rate cut season, it's the opposite, right? Because the economy is completely slowed down. Now, we did not get a rate cut last night from Powell, and this is, you know, to be expected. I told you, I told you, I said to you, you know, you know, Powell said this on the 2nd of May, but if you go back to one of my, my latest video before this one, sometime in April, I said forget about seeing a rate cut, at least until December, right? So this was two weeks before Powell said it, and he confirmed that last night, that we didn't get it, and it's not coming anytime soon. And I've never seen Jerome try to be as you know strategically clear about that in fact he was dovish 
Yesterday, we had a dovish power. So, I've taught on rate cuts, rate hikes, and its impact on market sentiment and its actual praxis, its implication in the economy. Now, more terms to know is when somebody says, you know, so-and-so was hawkish, so-and-so was dovish. When you're watching Bloomberg News and they talk about dovish power, the reason why is, as soon as you see that on headlines, if you understand what it means, you already know the sentiment that's driving markets, the fundamental in, uh, uh, principles underpinning, right, intrinsic price of an asset, NASDAQ, Bitcoin, Euro USD, right? And then because you know what dovish or hawkish means, you can start to speak speculate where price will go just simply based on that right you can't take a trade off it but you kind of like know the environment are you in a seller's environment or are you in a buyer's environment that's what i'm trying to do here right so yesterday power was very dovish on the 2nd of may we got a very dovish power 2nd of may i don't know is today yeah no sorry on the 1st of may so 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 today is the 2nd of may i'm making this video power was on last night on the 1st of may it was extremely dovish now let's break these terms down the terms hawkish and dovish refer to stances or positions or you know different federal reserve type of thinking with regards to monetary policy. They use monetary policy to, you know, stimulate, right? Create growth and, and a boom in the market or to tighten, to slow down the economy. The only tool they have is monetary policy. So monetary policy can either be hawkish or dovish. Now a hawkish Fed, and we've seen power very hawkish, We've traded power very hawkish on this channel. A hawkish Fed generally implies a more aggressive or restrictive or tighter, that's another word, a tighter monetary policy stance. This means the Federal Reserve is more concerned about controlling inflation. Inflation is scaring them. Inflation is their main priority. It's the only thing they're focused on. It was at 8% back then in 2023, or before 2023, 2022 rather, you know, before I took my sabbatical. We're looking at a high CPI of like 8.5, 8 8.8, 8 7.7. When inflation was that high, you get a very hawkish Fed, an aggressive Fed, a Fed that believes inflation is strength is threatening you know the viability and sustainability of an economy so in that particular case you will see them tighten the monetary policy and one of the key things to identify especially during these speeches especially when they are talking because no one is going to write it out to you on those Bloomberg articles hi the Fed is hawkish and this is what it means no one's going to explain that stuff to you that way you need to just know what you're looking for and here are some key characteristics of a hawkish fit number one interest rates hikes they will hike the interest rate so they'll keep hiking they'll keep hiking right because they want to control inflation they want to get aggressive to slow down the economy, all right? So a hawkish Fed is more likely to increase the interest rates to curb inflationary pressures by raising the rates, like I've explained already, borrowing becomes expensive, which can slow down economic activity and hopefully reduce inflation, right? So in, their, in Powell's speech, if he was hawkish, there would be a lot of focus on inflation. That would be the Fed's primary goal, right? To uh, Under a hawkish stance, the main goal is to keep inflation in check. So they'll keep telling us, look man, we want 2% inflation, we're at 8%. So uh, between now and the next meeting in three months time, we wanna drop 8% to 7%, you know, and this is how we're gonna do it. Everything is about tightening the, you know, you know, no, no, the leash around the inflationary beast, all right? There is always less emphasis on stimulus so no printing money, no QE, no, no large treasury, you know, reserves, you know, happening because again, a hawkish Fed is less likely to implement stimulus measures like quantitative easing to boost the economy as it fears this will all aggravate the inflationary issues they have. So we, when the Fed is hawkish, you will hear them say or me say or Bloomberg say we have a restrictive monetary policy number one which means the fed is 
tightening, number two, by raising interest rates, all right? Therefore, you get um, uh, uh, interest hikes, right? And we see risky assets fall. This is important. You will see, you will see your Nasdaq fall. You will see your crypto fall. You will see anything that's risk sensitive, Euro USD fall. You will see your safe havens fly, DXY, gold, etc. Right, so this is how you understand the stuff. Once the Fed is hawkish, we expect to see Fed tightening. When Fed tightening happens, we expect to see all risky assets fall. So the stock markets will fall. Right, and I can show you a historical example. For example, this is Nasdaq, right? During uh, uh, no, 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 a, a hawkish Fed, a hawkish Fed took place after 2021. So first, the Fed printed a lot of money during COVID. Kept printing money, printing money. People were not working. There were stimulus checks. Kept stimulating the economy, and then inflation came out, and then there was this big inflation problem. So now we saw a hawkish Fed. When a hawkish Fed came in, we were selling our risky assets. We were swing trading Nasdaq for days to weeks to months, and it happened on this channel. We kept coming week after week in the war rooms to agree we're going lower, we're going lower. At some point, I kept telling you guys, my goal is to hopefully get the markets to agree with me, which they never do. Markets will never agree with you. They'll never do what you want. That was my ego there. But my, my goal is to align myself with the markets. And back then I was hoping the markets would go all the way to 2020 demands. That's, that's how low price was aiming for, but also how long we were able to anticipate correct market direction by understanding what a hawkish fed means. In the other side, or, or the other type of Fed stance, which is dovish, when the Fed is dovish, when I say the Fed is dovish, it indicates a more accommodative Fed. Remember I said last night, on the 1st of May 2024, mark my words, Powell was dovish. This changes the game, because now we know he's dovish, and I'll explain why I say that, because of what he said, we'll break that down, but I want you to understand these terms before we get into that. Right, dovish indicates a much more accommodative, um, uh, you know, you know, a, a expansionary monetary policy. So instead of tightening, you actually leave wiggle room. You, you're free to expand. A dovish Fed is not concerned. Inflation is not at the top. Right. Yes, inflation will always be there, but it's not at the top like a hawkish Fed. A dovish Fed is concerned about supporting economic growth. A dovish Fed is scared of stagflation. A dovish Fed does not want to see recession. He wants to see e economic growth and employment, employment start. And if Powell, anytime you see Powell stand up in front of a screen, he will tell you the main purpose of the FOMC is to ensure gainful employment. This is like his primary goal. The reason why he got the job, right? He's seen for presidential elections. So Powell is his office outlast presidents, right? In America, the most a president can do is two terms, which is eight years. He's seen four, right? He's seen four, okay? So that's almost 16 years in office. He's seen Obama come and go, Trump come and go, Biden come and go, all right? It's literally, the, the, the whole point is long-term economic sustainability, long-term employment gainfulness sustainability, and a dovish Fed focuses on that. Even if it means accepting, this is so important. If, if I was your lecturer, I used to lecture industrial economic sociology at Rose University. If I was a, a lecturer in first year, second year, third year, I would need you to make sure I understand that you understand this by adding this last part. A dovish Fed is willing to accept a slightly high level of inflation if he or she believes they can control it long term. Now, let's think about this. We've got April data, and, and maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but if you remember my first video back, which I released about 10, 14 days ago, I told you that if you look at the April data, CPI told us straight up in our face, inflation is still high. You are nowhere close to your 2% target. Month over month is high. Year over year is high. PCP, same thing, high. Right, So you still have an inflation problem. 
but power last night. So this is where what he says and what it means and what you do has to come together. Power last night said a very interesting thing. He said, look, I am aware that we have not, we are not getting to our inflationary goals as quickly as we thought. I am also aware that in the short term, yeah, it looks like inflation is high, but I'm confident that in the long term, we'll get to that number. So that, that's very dovish. Like I'm not freaking out about inflation anymore. I'm pretty sure we're gonna get there. There's been a slight delay, that, that, that's all he said. And so a dovish Fed is sometimes a person who's willing to accept a slightly high level of inflation, right? And here are the key characteristics of a dovish Fed, but a lot of the things that came out from last night's meeting. Number one, interest rate cuts, right? Didn't happen. A dovish Fed is more inclined to cut interest rates. So generally speaking, they'll cut them. Last night, we didn't get one. We didn't get a cut. We got we got the a promise of a cut, the likelihood of a cut, maybe in December, because he wants to ride the wave. He kept saying, we're gonna be you know, instructed and influenced by more data coming, so we're gonna look at some data. And remember, when Powell says this, just know it's a three-month stretch. Banks think in three months, take profits in one year in a 10-year plan. That means we need three CPI data points. We need three NFP reports. He's not going to take the first NFP and CPI and that's enough. He's going to want to see a gradual incline of inflation or decline. You don't get that from one report, right? It comes, right, May report, oh, okay. June report, oh, okay. July report, oh, okay. September, it's going to be an interesting FOMC meeting. November elections. He said last night, look, man, I don't care about elections. I don't care who's president. I'm just, um, I'm, 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 summarizing, right? This is not verbatim, but he basically said politics don't interfere with the task of the Fed. That he definitely said. Actually, he said it in a quite an angry tone, right? That I've seen four presidents come and go. My job is to control inflation and make sure I, I, I maintain gainful employment, right? So uh, normally a dovish Fed is more inclined to cut interest rates. We got no cut yesterday, but maybe a future cut in December, all right? And the reason for this is cutting interest rates will stimulate borrowing and spending, thereby boosting the economy. And the reason why we did not get a cut last night on the 1st of May is because the economy is still too high. You know, it's still a bit overheating. Inflation is still out of control based on April data, right? April CPI data, right? Number two, a dovish uh, Fed, and if you listen carefully last night, will always focus on employment, which he did. The primary focus of a dovish Fed is to support what they call maximum employment. That is, the relationship between supply and demand has to be well balanced between those who want to work, are able to work, where they want to work. If I am an IT specialist, you can't say there is maximum employment in the economy if I'm working at Steers delivering takeaways for Uber, for example. I have to be an IT specialist working in IT, you know, doing computer stuff. Okay, that is gainful employment where I, my skill set is being used for the right job, right? That's the so so, so 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 that's number two. The 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 main focus around employment there is it will be willing to tolerate a slight temporary increase in inflation if it helps achieve the goals. So traders, this week ah by the time you see this video, I hope I put it out on time, right? Because this coming Friday, the third of May, tomorrow is NFP. That's what Powell is looking at. He's looking at those numbers, right? How is there more supply in the labor market that is more jobs than workers, all right? That relationship has to be taken care of because he will tolerate slight increase in inflation if it helps achieve maximum employment goals. Number two, generally speaking, a dovish Fed has a readiness for stimulus. A dovish Fed is more likely to use the unconventional 
uh, monetary policy ways like we saw in 2020, right? Printing of money, etc., to stimulate the economy. That's not what we're doing now. Last night we made that very clear. That's not where they are. In fact, they cut. They cut a lot of you know spending in their bank bonds, right? Monetary policy easing is uh, is what we saw in 2020. So I'm going to show you again. Same Nasdaq chart now. But now during monetary policy easing, because monetary policy easing equals expansion, that particular expansion is bullish for risk as, uh, you know, risk uh, on assets. I apologize. That means last night when power came out very dovish, this was actually very positive for stocks. Very positive for risk on assets. If you're watching uh, Powell talk while watching the charts last night, you would have seen DXY fall. You know, the dollar fell below um, um, uh, my uh, big trend line. Uh, uh, Bitcoin went up by about 1%. S&P 500, NASDAQ, US 30, all went up by 1%. I know now prices kind of like, you know, you know, settled down again to the downside. But as he was talking, market responded right the volatility was positive uh, and powell did that by doing uh, several few other things that i want to quickly get into but before i move on i really want to make sure that we are all clear the difference between a hawkish fed and a dovish fed lies in the approach to how they manage the economy through monetary policy hawkish fed will prioritize controlling inflation right and adopt a tighter policy by hiking rates. In contrast, a dovish Fed will prioritize stimulating the economy, uh, uh, economy growth, making sure the employment is growing, more likely to use a much more accommodative policy tools like interest rate cuts, right, and stimulus measures. Now, last night, what did Powell say? Now that you know this, now that you know all these different things, like, and I hope you take my word for it, but you go back and you listen to Powell, you'll see he was dovish. Powell said a couple of key things. Now, this is very much verbatim, or at least close to verbatim. Number one, he said, look, man, no potential rate cut hikes. Rate hikes not happening anytime soon, right? So he canceled any potential rate hikes, right? But he gave three very interesting paths. So the path number one was, if there is, say, more persistent inflation in 2024, then they will hold off on rate cuts. There will be no need to stimulate the economy now that you know what a rate cut does because the economy is a bit hot. If they see persistent inflation, they will hold off on rate cuts. Number two, another different path that he's looking at, if there is greater confidence in more inflation, then he'll cut. And number three, he said unexpected weakening in the labor market. If all of a sudden those NFP numbers start to miss, one month they miss, second month they miss, yo, the, the unexpected weakening in the labor market, he's also going to cut. He's going to rush to cut to stimulate the market when those two big targets are missed. That's something he definitely said. And then he said, when, when one of the reporters asks, well, what, what about wage price spiral? I've taught on this, you know, or, 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 you know, on the channel, wage price spiral. When NFP drops tomorrow, Friday, the 3rd of May, uh, even if you watch this video after the 3rd of May, go back and check the data point. It will tell you NFP, right, which is, you know, how many jobs were gained, blah, blah, blah. But below that, there is also unemployment stats and also wage stats, right? So, so the, is the earning living wage going up or below? And he said he was not worried about wage gains. Remember, if people are getting paid more and more as their wages increase, their buying power increases. If your buying power increases, you can go do more spending. If you can do more spending, you're still making the economy. If you're still making the economy, you are contributing to inflation. He said, and, and this is what I mean by dovish. You know, a hawkish Fed would be like, yo, we'll be looking at, that, uh, at those wages uh, numbers. If there's a wage price spiral, we'll try and combat it by you know, increasing our rate hikes. He said last night, I'm not worried about wage gains. I've seen wage gains happen in the past and still, you know, we were able to, 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 to kind of like sail through it, right? So that's super dovish. He doesn't care anymore apparently you know in 2022 he cared 
In 2023, he cared. Now he's like, you know what? It's not a big deal. We'll see how it goes. We've seen, you know, wages go up and, and the economy, you know, do well. Like, we've we, we still got a good, strong economy. Labor market's still doing well. That is dovish. He was dovish there again. He then he said, because remember, are you not then worried about inflation? It's like the second half of the year, in, we expect inflation to be lower. So he's saying, look, man, inflation is high now. I get the report, the April report, but that's short term. Short term inflation is not worrisome to me anymore because overall, I do believe that I can see this number declining. And so I assume you will start to see what I see as power in the second half of the year as inflation continues to nosedive, right? So, so that's what he did. That naturally, uh, 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 you know, my amazing subscribers, I uh, got rid of many market fears. That was bullish. That was extremely positive, you know, news to the market. And all of a sudden, the, the, the inflation expectation concern was pushed aside by Powell. He simply said, yes, inflation is going up in the short term, but in the long term, we'll go. That's bullish for the market. And then he talked about the rate hike concern. I'm not, I'm not uh, hiking rates anytime soon. There will be no rate hikes anytime soon. Bullish for the market. And then what about wage price spiral? Not worried about that. We've seen it. It works well. We know what we're doing. Our tools have kept the economy going bullish for the market. He washed away, he got rid of a lot of bearish factors about the economy and, 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 and really actually even said at some point that they felt like they were back at pandemic. They were back at 2020 levels when it came to labor. Before the COVID problem came, Power feels like he's been able to unwound the economy, the labor market specifically, to pre-pandemic levels. So he's like, yeah, I've done a good job. We've done a good job. He was patting himself on the back there. And overall, last night meeting was extremely uh, uh, positive. Yes, you, you're looking at your chest now. You're like, how, Leroy? Right? We can talk about supply and demand. We can talk about previous order flows. But I'm talking about overall direction moving forward right now. It feels like, you know, the pressure has to come off the dollar because the dollar was really the gunner. You know, for the last two months or so, the dollar has been very wild, right? Money has been pouring to the dollar, you know, uh, as these inflation numbers were, were, were popping up, money kept going to the dollar. And now all of a sudden, the power has come to correct that and say, yes, I get it, inflation is high, but don't worry, we have a plan, right? So he's very opposed to raising rates. He did mention that they'll be very data dependent. They, he says this all the time. So the next few reports are very important, but the report that carries the highest burden is the report of the 15th of May. So diarize that. The next CPI report on the 15th of May has to at least back Powell up a little bit. A lot is riding out on it because Powell went out of his way, out of his way to purge a lot of fear in the market. So if a uh, 15 May CPI uh, report is a miss and inflation is hot, 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 please be ready to sell. If you want, not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just telling you what I'm going to be doing. Right now, let's quickly put a 365 spin on all of this because all I've done now is just taught you fundamentals, taught you the basics, taught you the sentiment, explained what I heard yesterday. And then now I want to give you some critical thinking around it. Right. Number one, remember, and the problem is that inflation is not going away. That's part of the problem. The problem is inflation is not going away but is also progressively getting worse i didn't feel power acknowledge that but that is what i'm seeing in the data like if you look at your, your cpi data yes power is not worried but i mean i have to trade the market not trade what the what the Fed chair wants the rest of us to believe. There's a big difference, right? Just like how when you take data from the market, you take it and you interpret it according to your trader's edge. So now I'm talking to you in terms of what you're going to do. I'm saying to you, he made it seem like inflation not going away is the problem. Like it'll go away eventually. But he didn't address the fact that not only is it not going away, it's technically getting worse. You can say it's getting worse short term, but I can promise you 
That's not the case. In fact, historically speaking, you don't deal with inflation overnight. It can take five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. 10 years fighting inflation, unless you have a, an incredibly uh, a strict Fed with the higher resolve. It can take a very long time historically. And we see it everywhere. I mean, if we just look at, you know, you know, uh, uh, the month of April, we saw, you know, all sorts of things. For example, you know, consumer prices rose 3.5%. Energy prices rose 1,1% after increasing 2,3% in Feb. It's getting worse and worse. Shelter costs were higher by 0,4% on the month up at 5,7%. Eggs, come on, eggs are going up. Medical car services prices rose at 0,6%, right? So this is not a problem that Powell can just ignore. And I really want us to be careful or rather not to let the Fed you know, maneuver, manipulate. Even if you see this video after NFP, just remember this, there's a lot, lot going on. And I get I get asked all the time, any updates on Bitcoin? You know, Bitcoin with what Bitcoin has to do. Hong Kong on the 30th of April, I could be wrong, but 30th April released, I'm still waiting to gain access to trade it as well, but right now it's, you know, I don't think it's up on stonks yet. Um, I'll check later and I'll let you know. But yeah, Hong Kong released um, a new Bitcoin ETF. So that's bullish for crypto, right? Because it, it signals, number one, that there'll be several new kinds of ETFs, not just the BlackRock ETF out there now, right? So in future, we're going to get more and more of these things. Just to remind you, though, about what this means, right? Remember, we're starting to see, I mean, I remember seeing an article on Cointelegram, right, where BlackRock actually recorded its first day of zero, zero, the whole day of no ETF purchases ever, right? You know, before 56 million, you know, was pouring in, you know, quite regularly. Now it recorded its first day of not a single dollar being pumped into the market to buy a Bitcoin ETF, right? So, so, uh, 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 as the reserves slow down, as money inflow slows down into these ETFs after halving, right, and you see ETF slows down, it means that wherever price is, 57, 58, 60, 70, 80, you gotta think about this logically, the higher price goes up for Bitcoin, the more money is needed to be pumped into Bitcoin to boost the price higher. It's like, a, you know, what you call those things? A, a hamster on a wheel. You never get to your destination. So carrying a $1 Bitcoin won't take much effort to make $2. Making a $2 Bitcoin get to $15 might take three or so extra buyers. But getting a 70,000 US dollar Bitcoin to a hundred thousand is gonna need our grannies, our mommies, our aunts, aunts, our sisters, cousins to pump in their money to push price up. Obviously, we've got institutional flow right now, so that money will come. But everyone's gonna be thinking of ROI, return of investment. And return of investment means we go back to the basics where we buy low. If you can't get more money at the top to pump an asset up, the asset must tank to go back and find low buys where your logical investors are, where your logical whales are. They know the intrinsic value, but they are thinking of their return of investment. So instead of buying Bitcoin at 70, I'll buy it at 55. Can it get to 40? Will it get to 30, right? You know, right now I'm looking at a simple level around 56, 55,000, but I'm simply saying, you have to think about that. For price to go up, you need more buying in, right? So, you know, this is kind of like the stuff I prepared for you today. I don't want to make this any longer than it needs to be. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to leave a comment in a day. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely respond. But more importantly, if you want to gain a mastery of market information, link down below to join us. 365, shake my hand, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.